We have a collection of forms of spirit in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Escape my forgetness now. Scratching it and patching at with a prompt from a primer and what scripts of Dutz knowledges I pecked up myself, me myself. Every letter is a hard, but yours sure is the hardest crux ever. That's a reference to the letter from Boston that I mentioned in a previous post. Because we're at the end of the wake now, when Anne Olivia is dis disappearing into the sea. Escape my forgetness now. Back in Alien Revelry, which I mentioned uh, last post, being the truth, is back in, Alien, back in Alien Revel. It's all very well, but as Hegel reminds us, champagne produces no poetry. This is in the aesthetics. But the heat of the blood achieves nothing by itself. Champagne produces no poetry, as Marmontel, for example, tells how in his cellar, in Champagne, he had 6,000 bottles confronting him, and yet nothing poetic flowed out of them for him. So too, the finest genius may often enough lie in the grass, morning and evening, enjoying a fresh breeze and gazing up into the sky, but of tender inspiration, not a breath reaches him. In the book of his memoirs, that's from the aesthetics, this has been talking now. In the book, two of his memoirs, Marmontel, a historian and writer, says that his imagination was warmed when he was in congenital, <laughs> congenial feminine company and surrounded by 50,000 bottles of champagne. He does not indicate whether he was motiv motivated by them or by the lady. Hegel's remark may be a confused recollection of this passage. I'm more of a vodka person myself, but uh, it doesn't give me any inspiration, so I keep off the stuff when I'm engaging with complex material like this. And if I appear a bit drunk, it's because it's four, well, half past four in the morning. So I'm tired. Anyway, I digress. Spirit. Spirit and nature may be closely connected, but creativity cannot be generated merely through the stimuli of sensation. The I'll quote there from Cecinato. That's how it's pronounced. May it takes as the title, Champagne does not produce poetry. Erinnerung and Gedeckness in Hegel's Theory of Artistic Genius. But I've been through the difference between Erinnerung and Gedeckness before. Memory. Moreover, insofar as the person of genius partly depends on a natural element of mediacy and exteriority that is independent of his subjective will, the inner outer dialect is also articulated as a nature spirit dialect. Furthermore, a question presents itself as to the difference between what a literary person and a philosophical person are about, once the literary person is being philosophical. The answer is in the form in which their expression is articulated. The literary person employs imagery. His or her distinctive activity is the expression of the human spirit to imagination. But images, pictures, representations are not the reality, but ideas that stand for the reality. The philosopher employs the pure notion as a form of expression thereby eschewing metaphor in the analysis of concepts and barring the employment of imagery as he or she conceptualizes in a non-sensory manner. At one level there is the self-expression of an individual, at another that of a nation, and yet another at that of the divine or the absolute. 
The phenomenon of consciousness, of being at the individual or at the national level, can at least be understood. The former describes the universal phenomenon of the individual's own consciousness, of its being, as it unfolds, in the process of which objective spirit or national identity uh, begin to emerge. Phenomenology being a descriptive enterprise, I know that I have proven nothing. Phenomenology, as Hegel says in the Phenom Phenomenology of Spirit, constitutes the science of knowing in the sphere of appearance. And any objections one cares to level against this inquiry would need to take the form of charging the phenomenological descriptions as being awry. To describe something, there is always the possibility of misdescribing it. That is one of the pitfalls of uh, phenomenology. But further, that the absolute consciousness of being is God's own self-knowledge in the world, considered as the unfolding history of the universe, how is one to describe that? One way is through an introspective historical observation of the history of creative expressions. The narrative of the wake, in fact, during the course of which the absolute becomes evident. An individual self-consciousness is a finite moment of God's own self-consciousness objectified in the world of nature, and the fullest expression of being is the imaginative creativity of subjective spirit. A facet of national spirit uh, that produces literary works like The Wake, a creative expression of the human and divine spirit. The connotative source of the symbol may well be a rational notion, but while in literature harmonization with the world is to be discovered in tales and myths, in philosophy once the aporias of truding upon a comprehension of the world in a rational form are resolved, a sort of rational insight is achieved by a form of spirit that is absolute. The science of appearances shows how the categories operate when instantiated in various worldviews. And there's another quote from the phenomenology there. The content of this picture thinking at the level of religion is absolute spirit. And all that now remains to be done is to supersede this mere form, or rather, since this belongs to consciousness, as such is truth must already have yielded itself in the shape of consciousness. Absolute knowing is accomplished once it is understood that satisfaction in the world has proven to be elusive through coming to the world in the wrong way, adopting limited conceptions that must be made more complete. Absolute knowing relates to the idea of complete or unimpaired rational cognition of the world, rather than to knowledge of some non-worldly -world entity, the absolute. Consciousness was learned to bring such uh, limited conceptions together, recapitulating the various stages that the dialectic has already taken. Previous standpoints adopted by consciousness being one-sided, the truth lies in seeing how no one of them does justice to the way in which individuality, particularity and universality are related in the object. Another quote there from the phenomenology. Thus the object is in part immediate being or in general a thing, corresponding to immediate consciousness, in part an othering of itself in relation, in relationship or being for another and being for itself, that is, determinedness corresponding to perception and in part essence or in the form of a universal corresponding to the understanding.
The various standpoints, each on its own, prove to be incomplete, and what is now required is a way of unifying them into a more complex whole. As he writes in the phenomenology, phenomenology, these are the moments of which the reconciliation of spirit with us, its own consciousness proper, is composed by themselves. They are single and separate, and it is solely their sep spiritual unity that constitutes the power of this reconciliation. The last of these moments is, however, necessarily this unity itself, and as is evident, it binds them all into itself. <sighs> Go back to that quote from Mercetel, whether he was inspired by the champagne or the ladies. There can be a bit of a distraction, but I find them inspirational myself. Anyway, I'm digressing again. Recollection achieves this. Yes, recollection achieves this whereby single and separate moments are put alongside one another to show where each is inadequate when taken on its own. Our own act here has been simply to gather together the separate moments, each of which in principle exhibits the life of spirit in its entirety. Spirit comes to see through a process of self-examination that it can arrive at a view of the world that will make the world fully intelligible, where until then it had appeared alien to consciousness. Absolute knowing requires the achievement of a particular kind of dialectical outlook. Spirit, therefore, having won the notion, displays its existence and movement in this ether of its life and is science. In this, the moments of its movement no longer exhibit themselves as specific shapes of consciousness, but since consciousness, consciousness's difference has returned into the self as specific notions and as their organic self-grounded movement. The principal force behind idea, idealized philosophy is that ideas are realities, they have a power, they can unfold themselves into reality, and our thinking is indeed a real thing, a part of reality, not something opposed to it, nor a hazy picture of it. Now, I have a quote from C.S. Peirce here, the cap, which I'm going to dispute, the capital error of Hegel, which permeates his whole system in every part of it, is that he almost altogether ignores the outward clash besides the lower consciousness of feeling and the high consciousness of intuition, this direct consciousness of hitting and get of getting hit enters into all cognition and serves to make it mean something real. Now this is phenomenologically false and committed equivocation. I have a quote there from the Hegel's Encyclopedia Logic. We must be in touch with our subject matter, whether it be by means of an, our external senses or else by our, our profounder mind and our intimate self-consciousness. A spiritual case of such spiritual activity, no, a special case of such spiritual activity, is intentional agency, together with a self-conscious understanding of it that is both theoretical and practical, of the form of a Recollective reconciliation of traditional and modern structures informed by a particular understanding of them. 
Such ethical understanding of intentional agency is heroic for Hegel, for through it agents take responsibility for their deeds under all the descriptions that are accurate of those deeds. As he says in the elements in the philosophy of right, the heroic self-consciousness, as in ancient tragedies, like that of Oedipus, has not yet progressed from its unalloyed simplicity to reflect on the distinction between deed and action, between the external event and the purpose and knowledge of the circumstances, or to analyse the consequences minutely, but accept responsibility for the deed in its entirety. The Wake is a novel with a hero, and it is not Humphrey Chimpton Eureka. As Anna Livia said of, says of Humphrey, you're only a bumpkin. I thought you the great in all things, in guilt and in glory. You're but a puny. So, that's his wife speaking. As Anna Livia recollects, there is a gradual focusing of attention from sea and mountain to Dublin, the park, Chapel is on, the Eowicker household and HCE and ALP in bed. But in the place of Christian harmony, this Sunday morning, or of a mind at peace, there is the anxious, anxious, anxious deliberation of a guilty conscience, gambling from image to image in nervous disjointedness. Echoes resound of many pre prevalent themes from elsewhere in the wake, a ghostly, unreal metropolis is populated with disquieting creatures, goblins, fairies, elves, trolls, illustrative of guilt as not something that is in the mind, just as the intentions are not either. One does not know what action one is committing while one is performing it, but only in, respect, in retrospect. And one's deeds are a function of a particular kind of society, with ideas concerning responsibility and something being mine. For this latter, the notion of something being mine is not a metaphysical fact of reality. It is a form of social achievement that assumes many forms I'm losing my train of thought here this moment. It is a form of social achievement that assumes a variety of forms extending over a diverse range of societies and cultures. The notion of guilt endeavours to get hold of quite a potent notion of something being mine. This indeed is modernity's achievement, the notion that one sees oneself as a kind of self whose individual rights determine what is ultimately right or wrong. Indeed, it is a fundamental principle of a life together with others. A certain kind of communal expression in which one who is guided by conscious conscience has to learn. For deeds require a community to recognise them for what they are, and that requires such language, games, with which the wake abounds, playing upon two elements of deeds, intention and expression. An act intended is the deed performed, what is expressed in the deed done is one's relationship to it, and the claims that a particular act is done as a matter of conscience, expresses the strong binding of oneself to the character of that act. A guilty conscience depends upon communal ethics, but what of a conscience that takes on the whole of history, the entirety of cultures, in particular where original sin supposedly resides, blighting every spirit.
Anna. Anna Olivia. Will exonerate Humphrey Chimpton from his guilt while literally and metaphorically trying to wake him up. In her mind's eye, they are out walking. And I quote from The Wake Now Not such big strides, hoodie foddy. Hoodie, hoodie foddy, as in footy duddy, or holy father. She is bringing him to a place they know well by yonder house. She could bring him there with her eyes closed. And I still by you in bed, she says. I don't think they ever actually get out of bed, really. They are alone and have lots of time on their hands, time before the events of the past are reenacted, before the hounds are let loose and the citizens go chasing him all over the countryside, wanting to entomb him after what he did in the park, just because the two hussies thought that they heard a cock crow and saw him standing there and the three soldiers behind him. But he came safe through enough of that old woman's gossip. They might call on the old lord. He must remember to doff his hat when he steps into the presence. He must repeat, how do you do, your majesty? Perhaps the earl will knight him or make him the first chief magistrate. His silly head full of fancies. They can just go and sit down there on the head of house in the wild heather. Alone, just the two of them again, side by side, just sit there in the peace of the early morning and scan the horizon and see if that letter he is always waiting for turns up, thrown ashore by the waves. She tells him how she made it up herself with a prompt from a primer, herself and Shem, stuffing it into all the bits of knowledge uh, that she picked up. It was an arduous task. It will turn up all right some day, it will, she promises. Today, perhaps, as in her mind, it divides in two. Hers buried again in the midden. And his bobbing in a bottle upon the waves. ALP is exquisitely pleased about the lovely, the lovely vest because she's losing her leaves, leaves of memory. The love, love leaves dress she has as it gradually disintegrates. She wears a beautiful gown, all leafy, but little by little her fiancé's moving dress is coming apart. One leaf after the other flees toward the sea on the fugitive waters. Once on a leaf, leaf glides on a wave that goes to mingle its foam with eternal waves. A leaf, just a leaf, and then leaves. Here she murmurs again, I only hope. All the heavens see us, for I feel I could near to faint away into the deeps. She carries one last leaf with her to remind her of life, and all things are reflected in their opposites. For the leaf is the leaf she first took to herself in the Garden of Eden, ALP, never disavows original sin. Which reminds me of something that Hegel said in a letter to Schelling in 1795. I exhort myself always in the words of the Lebensloaf. Strive toward the sun, my friends, that the salvation of the human race may soon, soon come to fruition. What use are the hindering Leaves or the branches, cleave through them to the sunlight. Strive till ye be weary, it is good so, for so shall ye sleep the better.
Those shall be sleepily bettered. That's not a typo, that's exactly what it's uh, exactly quoting there. That's what it says in the translation I have anyway. The phenomenology <coughs> assumes the task of transforming one's understanding of that which in the first place seems to be merely coincidental or contingent to that of something which one recognizes in its necessity the rational element and the rhythm of the organic whole, as Plato says, as, I don't know why I said Plato there, as Hegel said, that which philosophy performs, in hindsight, transforming something that was contingent and now because of being actual is understood as being necessary. As he says in the Phenomenology, it is in this nature of what is to be, in its being, its own notion, the logical necessity in general consists. This alone is the rational element and the rhythm of the organic whole. It is as much knowledge of the content as the content is the notion and essence. In other words, it alone is speculative philosophy. The self-moving concrete shape makes itself into a simple determinatus. In so doing, it raises itself to a logical form and exists in its essentiality. Its concrete existence is just this movement and it is, it is directly a logical existence. It is for this reason unnecessary to clothe the content in an external logical formalism. The content is in its very nature the transition into such formal formalism Yes, that should be one word there, formalism. But if formalism which ceases to be external, since the form is the in innate development of the concrete content itself. Yes, first we feel, then we fall. That's from the wake. On the tram rolling toward Dublin, and I first saw the love light in Humphrey's eyes, an encounter grounded in total contingency. But once the falling in love has occurred, one's entire past life is seen as leading up to that moment, ALP waiting all her life for a ACE, and that which was contingent is transformed into something that makes sense, as though the event were a logical conclusion. Note Vindlichkeit. Note, this is the German for necessity, which Hegel uses. And I explained it, I break down the word there so you get the picture. Through the necessity of progression and interrelation, the necessary progression and interconnection of the forms of the unreal consciousness will by itself bring it to pass the complete the completion of the series. Through the necessity of progression and interrelation, um, sense can be made of events by understanding the dynamic necessity of the context of an organic whole, for the life of the whole has a certain rhythm, a certain progress like ripples spreading through a river like the course the river itself takes. ALP represents the process whereby necessity suggests a need for a crucial turnaround, like a river diverted, to resolve the critical moment for to understand why something is necessary is to understand why something is critical in a given situation. The aim is to understand how every moment of the life of the whole is critical to the whole, and thereby to reconstruct the whole history of spirit whereby the significance of every critical moment in history is understood. For an individual, this amounts to understanding the critical points in one's own individual development that contribute to the person one now is. It was critical that Anna Olivia fell in love with H.T.E. Humphrey at that moment. A certain need resolved itself to the encounter. Furthermore, 
what was a simple combination between the world and the mind becomes a specifiable relationship that can be expressed as a form of spirit, all of which encounter rational complications toward the realization of the whole, but the final form is of the absolute idea freely streaming into distributary channels, first of nature, then of universal spirit. The universal is therefore free power. It is itself while reaching, this is from the science of logic, it is itself while reaching out to its other and embracing it, but without doing violence to it on the contrary, it is at rest in its other as in its own, just as it has been called free power, it could also be called free love and boundless blessedness. For it relates to that which is distinct from it, as to itself, in it, it has returned to itself. It obviously has in mind Romeo and Juliet here. My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love is deep, the more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. The life of spirit is not the life that shrinks from death and keeps itself untouched by devastation but rather the life that endures it and maintains itself in it. It wins its truth only when in utter dismemberment it finds itself. It is this power, not as something positive, which closes its eyes to the negative, as when we say of something that it is nothing or is false, and then having done with it, turn away and pass on something else, pass on to something else, on the contrary, spirit is this power only by looking the negative in the face and tarrying with it, and this tarrying with the negative is the magical power that converts it into being. Hence the last words in the wake of Anna Livia, as Anna Livia disappears into the sea. A last a love the long the which is at last the universal Jesus. Hegel said, free power, free love, boundless blessedness. The end. There's a rather boundless blessedness. I finish. Thank you for listening.